Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. Tonight's session is an open session on uh, mounts in general. So um, basically we're at the mercy of whatever questions come in. I have one question that was uh, asked specifically in regards to my setup. So I'm gonna try and cover that one first uh, and then we'll go on to the more general stuff. And I do see a couple questions come in. I have one question that was uh, asked specifically in regards to Got him muted. Uh, yeah. Uh, Direct link to get into this room is posted in chat. You can get there. Just please mute your mic on entrance. So uh, uh, otherwise I hear my own voice and it gets really uh, confusing. Um, before we do that, I do want to show off. Uh, otherwise I hear my own voice and it gets really Got to do it again. All right, there we go. Uh, this week's image of the week. Uh, goes to uh, Chad Andrus for his Western Bale Nebula. Um, very nice image here. Uh, FSQ 106 EDX uh, reduced. Uh, ZWO 1600 Mach 1. Lodestar OAG all narrow band. Uh, 4.16 hours. So uh, a, a relatively, uh, what I'd say, bright object for narrow band filters. Uh, one that I really love because it really stands out nicely uh, in wide field. Um, did a great job on it. Thanks, Chad, for submitting. There we go. Uh, this is all I believe I have in this window, so I'm going to close it and hopefully get my window back. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, one question came in over the weekend, and uh, – Edmund, I hope you don't mind that I answer it here. Um, uh, sometimes uh, I know I just need to kind of fill some time here. So uh, basically, uh, I like to save all the questions for when we're on air. Uh, so you've been a listener for a while. You've got a C-Gem and an Avalon M0. Uh, you're thinking about selling the C-Gem and upgrading to a premium mount. You know I have an, uh, a Mach 1. Um, you have... In your mind, you would like to uh, potentially use a 10RC. You have an 8RC. So you know the, what the RCs are like, but you want to know whether the Mach 1 can handle the capacity. Um, so the 10RC, uh, the TPO, um, uh, what's the other brand that does them? Uh, uh, Astrotech. Astrotech. The Astrotech and TPO. Yeah. Uh, basically very, very similar. Almost almost exact same. Uh, I believe the focuser is slightly different. Uh, but uh, for both of them, if you're doing really difficult or uh, I shouldn't say difficult, but really uh, our type of imaging, you're probably going to want to upgrade the focuser. In fact, you're almost certainly going to want to upgrade the focuser. Um, and... Um, the uh, it, I believe both of them are available in uh, aluminum tube and carbon fiber tube. So what I did with mine was I actually went with the aluminum tube and upgraded focuser. So if I remember correctly, that alone is 45 pounds. Uh, the 10 inch aluminum tube, focuser, uh, dovetail bar is 45 pounds, which I think is right at the proposed capacity of the Mach 1. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, 45 pounds when I add my camera to that. Uh, and my camera has the off-axis kiter and all of that. So I'm right at the capacity of the Mach 1 with my setup. Um, and the Mach 1's been able to handle it no problem. In addition to that, though, I have a pretty heavy... Um, distribution box that sits on the very top, farther away from the central axis or the, the rotational axis of the mount, which is more difficult on it. So I'm gonna say I probably have like 50, 55 pounds on there, very far away from the rotational axis, axis and I've never had an issue, uh, never with this configuration. So, I am, uh, I, I hate to say that I'm really pushing the Mach 1 well beyond 
uh, its capacity, but I am. And um, when I bought my aluminum tube, my initial thought was to upgrade to the uh, uh, the 900 because the 900s uh, had just been discontinued and were basically selling for less than the Mach 1. And I used it and it worked really well. I used the Mach 1 with this really heavy setup and it worked really well. So I had absolutely no reason to buy a heavier mount um, because it was uh, sufficient. Um, so uh, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Uh, do I use PEC? I actually don't use PEC. Um, I, what would be the effect on the guiding, like the RMS error? Uh, I'm actually, I'm not certain because I really have never used PEC. Um, my so, uh, Mach 1 has a very long <clears throat> period. I think, I believe it's about five or six minutes. So the period, so the maximum they advertise is about, what, five or seven arc seconds. That's peak to peak. So there's about three and a half arc seconds on each side but because the period is so long it's very easily correctable with guiding but if it was it if it you had a, you're talking about a mount with a short period like two minutes then you have to use periodic error because they're they're coming back so fast every two minutes the periodic error is coming back so uh with a mach one it's kind of optional yeah and it's the the tolerances are so tight anyway that you're really uh, you're getting that performance that uh, you're expecting. Uh, whereas with other mounts, um, you may have to tweak it to get the performance you're expecting. Um, uh, that last question is kind of screaming at me because I had touched on it earlier, but I'm going to go to the second one because um, I, I was actually asked this earlier. Uh, when I shoot galaxies, uh, uh, when, okay, uh, he's shooting with a Lodestar X2 times 2, um, and it's getting bad with hot pixels. He's wondering if the PEC would allow to pick dimmer guide stars um, by going greater than five second or 10 second exposures. Uh, okay, so let me just kind of uh, say uh, a few things on that. First of all, if you're getting hot pixels with your load star, um, you wanna make sure that your darks are current uh, and the right temperature. Uh, if you're using PHG2, get your library, uh, redo your library. You really should not see hot pixels unless uh, there's very little signal that you're actually getting. So possibly you're just not getting any guide stars and that's why you're getting hot pixels uh, because that's all that's there. Um, but for hot pixels specifically, um, dark should just wipe them out. And then any residual graininess, if it's a uh, pattern, it, it might just be noise that you're gonna see when there's no actual, there are no stars in there. Uh, so um, you're hoping that the PEC will allow you to probably take longer exposures and um, still get good guiding with the mount. Well, it would be the mount, the, the Mach 1, I would say, that would allow you to get those five and 10 second exposures. In fact, I'd say five second exposure is no problem. Um, no PEC needed. Uh, I, 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 I almost wouldn't see an issue with 10 second exposures, though I could see 10 second exposures be, being slightly above optimal. Um, I shoot three second exposures. I'd have no issues at all going up to five second exposures, except I think some of the stars that I actually image would be oversaturated at five seconds. Um, now, my setup is uh, s slightly unique. Um, the SBIG off-axis guider that I use um, has a very large prism. Uh, 
I tend to shoot nebula as opposed to galaxies. So there tend to be a lot of stars around the nebula, uh, whereas the galaxies are a lot more, um, which uh, with uh, galaxies tend to have uh, fewer stars uh, that you'd be able to hit with a pickoff prism. Um, so that's how I would answer that. Um, so how portable is it? Uh, the difference between the Mach 1 and the M Uno might be a portable issue uh, for Dark Sight, Star Party, etc. Um, so I'm not sure exactly. Um, I, I'm not that familiar with the M Uno. Or I, I've seen it before. I just haven't, you know, taken it apart, picked it up, put it down. Uh, so M, M I, I have. Um, M Uno's will be a little bit more uh, <clears throat> portable, not because of its weights, weights, but counterweights are optional with the M Uno, so you wouldn't have to carry counterweights around with you. That that would be that would make it a little bit more portable. But as far as the the weight of the head, the mount head itself, they're almost identical. Okay. So the question then that I'll answer is. Um, how portable is Mach 1? Uh, I believe that the mount head is 35 pounds, uh, which for me, uh, no problem carrying it without taking it apart. Um, at first, I bred into it. Uh, I could take it apart uh, maybe maybe like 18 to 19 pounds or somewhere in that range, or 18 to 17 pounds, excuse me, somewhere in that range, um, but not necessary for me. Um, it can also fold up nicely into a case that I bought. Uh, I just have to flip the head a little bit. Uh, I just flip it away that it fits tighter and, uh, goes nicely into this small case that I have. Um, I, with my, um, uh, RC 10, uh, let me think here. Uh, how much encounter weights? I believe I'm using 45, maybe 48 pounds of counterweights. I don't remember the increments I'm using. Uh, and I do have a uh, jerry-rigged solution. Um, uh, I was short by a pound. And uh, I didn't want to buy, like, whole big counterweight. So I just got this big... Um, I don't know, this big steel bell thing, and I screwed it on the end uh, in, in replacement of the uh, um, <clears throat> lock thing that locks the counterweights on. And it's heavy enough that it holds it. It was the perfect weight. It's perfectly balanced now. And um, that's it. But uh, I, I want to say it's about 48 pounds. So that's a lot of weight in counterweights. Um, but it's a counterweight. Uh, 48 pounds of mount head is a lot different than 48 pounds of counterweights because, you know, you can take the counterweight off, uh, one at a time. Uh, the mount heads just don't, the, when you're taking it off the mount, you really have to be careful. Sometimes if your clutches are open, uh, it's going to wobble a funny way. Um, but, uh, I'm not a big guy. Uh, I'm tall, but I'm not like massive. Uh, I have no problem handling the Mach 1. Uh, I had concerns that with the 900, which I believe is 50 pounds, I would have uh, some issues. Um, so that's basically it, Edmund. That's how I would answer your question. Uh, if you do have any other specific questions in response to uh, what you saw here, feel free to email me and I'll, I'll respond generally in an, uh, directly in an email. Uh, I just did wa did want to fill some of the void here with uh, that info. So uh, thanks for the question. Hope that helped. Um, as I close that out, I'm going to jump back up because I know Linda had a question. Uh, Lasmandi PEC programming between sessions. I don't know if she had uh, gotten an answer. I do not know the answer to that. But a link was posted. Does not know how to say that. I wish I could help. I don't, if anyone can help her, 
uh, please let me know. Any other questions, comments on mounts, uh, whether it's in the room or outside the room? Um. So I, I, I talk, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Mach 1 and periodic error. Uh, so if anybody, I, I believe, if I may be wrong, but I don't think Mach 1s come with Pempro when you buy one. I know 1100s do, but I think Pem Mach 1s don't. Mm -hmm. But I highly recommend that you buy Pempro or, uh, you know, you could even download the, uh, the trial version and uh, that might, I think that has a 30 minute or uh, 20 or 30 minute limit of how, how long of a curve you could do, you know, samples you could correct. But if you own a Mach 1, I highly recommend that you get it, especially if uh, one guy was asking about doing long guide exposures. If you're going to do 10, 15 minute, 15 second guide exposures, then you should probably use periodic error correction. And the best way to do that with astrophysics mounts is with Pempro. Uh, Pempro is, was, I think, written by the guy who developed the astrophysics software. So they're really, uh, I mean, you could use Pempro to uh, program other mounts as well, but it really works really well with uh, astrophysics mounts. It's almost made for it, and it was all adapted to other brands. Yep, by Ray Graylack. That's right. Okay, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Um, so uh, I saw a question pop up. At what point does uh, modeling come into play? So uh, modeling um, modeling uh, is basically um, allows you to give uh, allows you to give your mount a number of points in the sky uh, so it so that it can do a few things better. Um, for pointing, uh, basically, if you take a number of points, um, you can have much more accurate pointing. And that has been the primary reason for wanting to do modeling, is that you get that. Oh, that's a good point. You know what? I was thinking, I was thinking uh, modeling for pointing, not guiding. All right, let's see here. Uh, Let me continue with what I was saying, just in case. Uh, I don't know whether he was saying that generally or in response to the guiding question, and that's kind of what was asked beyond that. But, uh, so uh, for pointing modeling, um, you take that those number of points. It allows you to point the telescope. Uh, almost uh, exactly at the target you're looking for. So for long focal length, <clears throat> excuse me, for long focal length imaging, you can point, uh, or I should say slew directly at the target, um, start your guiding, and go. Uh, you're basically assured that it's going to be pointing at the target. For those of us that are not using pointing, we will use um, plate solving. So we will point where we think the target is, take an image, plate solve it, and correct the field, take another image, plate solve it, and say, is that good enough? Is that pointing uh, accurately enough? If so, then we'll start our imaging session. Um, so in general, that's what pointing modeling had done. Now, with some more advanced mounts, better pointing models, uh, and, and, and this, I believe, specifically, uh, probably more specifically applies to uh, direct drive mounts or mounts that have absolute encoders or have some sort of uh, feedback loop that allows them to know, uh, or, or I should say, get some additional information from uh, the drive as to where the mount's pointed. pointed. Uh, so if you have one of those more advanced mounts, you can use those pointing models to avoid guiding, to get accurate enough pointing that you don't have to guide, accurate enough, accurate enough tracking that you don't need to guide. 
That said, at this point in imaging, um, guiding isn't that difficult. So a lot of us who may have those mounts uh, that are capable of that, or a lot of those of uh, those people who have those mounts that are capable of that, may choose to use um, uh, just plate solving to correct for the pointing error, and then guiding so that they don't have to worry about the pointing model, particularly when you're portable, so you don't have to make a pointing model each time. That said, it goes to whatever your preference is, whatever way you would like to uh, run your session. Uh, I saw a whole bunch of questions. Uh, oh, okay. So th this, mo this modeling question, uh, uh, Adam, I'll add a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, unless you ask about a specific mount, what does modeling do? It's a very general question. So you went through the general what modeling do, but specific mounts do specific things with that model. So mm -hmm. if somebody is interested in a, a particular brand, then we could talk about more about what the modeling does and each point does. Mm -hmm. But in general, this is that you're, you're right. Uh, additionally, uh, to do you to, to make use of modeling uh, with astrophysics mounts, you need that software called APCC. So that's not built into the hand controller. Uh, but like you said, with today's plate solving, you know, do you need that? Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I just want to add that you know, like unless it's a specific question about a specific mount, it's kind of hard to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There are some mount manufacturers. Paramount, for example, uh, puts a lot more value in the uh, pointing model, uh, and at the same time, can uh, uh, I'll say out of the box has more features than uh, the uh, astrophysics. Um, I, I believe that would be what would allow them to track uh, satellites better, uh, or or at least more accurately. Um, There'd be certain things that that pointing model will just do that will allow uh, slightly more features. Uh, I, I think uh, on, on the other side of that, astrophysics tends to like to uh, keep the features to a minimum and just make sure that the mount can do the uh, specific job it, it, it wants to do uh, very simply. Um, I think this is just a back and forth convo in the room. Um, uh, how reliable are stepper motors against servo motors for long exposure imaging? Um, I am not, uh, you know, I'm not uh, a mechanical engineer or anything like that. I don't know long term reliability between the two. Uh, and, and even my general knowledge of, of the difference of the two isn't so great. I don't know if anyone in here in the room has any better info than I'd be able to give. I can't uh, speak with any expertise on the different types of motors. Well, they, they uh, uh, some some mounts use most mounts use servo motors, and but some there are some mounts out there that use stepper motors. They tend to be more quiet, if that's a matter to you. But they also have the problem of uh, if you if the motor is because it's not a uh, so servo motors have so I don't want to use this term and people I want people to misunderstand but servo motors have encoders on them so the motor will run and the mount controller will get a feedback from where the, where the motor not where the mount is but where the motor is stepper motors they count the software counts steps it tells it to go hundred steps and it assumes that it did. So if you hold a stepper motor with a wrench and hold it in place, uh, it will try to go. It won't go, but the software will think it did. So it does, they don't have a feedback loop. Uh, so, but there are many mounts that work wonderfully with stepper motors. So as long as the mount is properly balanced, stepper motors are not a problem. For instance, I believe Orion Atlas and M Uno both use stepper motors. And there are many people who happily use them, but like uh, other mounts such as paramounts and astrophysics, uh, they use servo motors. Yeah, Adam's commenting that servos need to be tuned, which can be an issue with some very large telescopes. But um, 
Like um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that on like the, the mounts that we've been talking about. Like, I, I don't want to keep referring to brands, but uh, the mounts that we've been talking about, they don't need to be tuned. Um, a three part question coming in. So Lestra, in a while back, released a CGX mount. He would like to monitor the mount from a computer. Um, he's read the only way to connect the mount to a computer is via a hand controller, which has a USB-A cable. Uh, what software driver do you recommend to monitor the mount via the hand controller? On the mount, there's also a USB outlet. Uh, is there a way to monitor it via USB? Are there alternatives to the Celestron and the PWI driver for the CGX mount? Uh, thank you for the help. Okay, so I had a Celestron CPC, uh, but at the time the hand controller was the same thing as the um, uh, CG. Uh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, the, 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 the more common of the mouse, not the ABX, the step up, uh, CG, X, uh, CG, I'm forgetting the, the designation, but either way. Uh, so I believe it has the same hand controller. And the way you did it was uh, with uh, what looked like a little telephone plug. And on the other end of that was a USB plug, I believe. Um, that might be what Chris is talking about. From there, you had to run Celestron's software tool, which uh, was <clears throat> ASCOM compatible or somehow integrated with ASCOM uh, or somehow installed ASCOM. But uh, for imaging, um, I would just control it using my imaging program. So you could pull up on your computer the hand controller and it was legitimately a picture of the Celestron hand controller uh, that you could click with your mouse and go anywhere in the sky using just your mouse and, and laptop screen. But um, after installing the software and hooking up the uh, USB, uh, you did not need to um, uh, Click any. Uh, I'm sorry. After hooking up the USB, you could basically hook it up to your uh, imaging software. So I don't know exactly what your routine is, but uh, yes, it'll do what you're looking for. You just uh, don't know whether you want to do it uh, with like backyard EOS or uh, uh, do it manually. Um. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of people, uh, like once, if you're using like a software like SGP, uh, you really don't need those, that software. All you need to install is this ASCOM driver, mm -hmm. right? And then you connect your mount, whatever mount it is, being it's being Los Mandy or Celestron, you just tell SGP, here's your mount, and that's about it. You don't need addition, additional software. I mean, I, don't, I know some people use these uh, virtual hand controller software. They install them into computers, but I don't know what they're like. I don't know what you would use that for. To me, that's like a gimmick. You know, I, I mm -hmm. would I, I don't understand the advantage of that. Yeah, I had uh, I actually had a friend who used it. Uh, he probably found the one advantage to it. Um, used it for. Uh, solar uh but um had his uh laptop in his uh car so that you could look at it uh or monitor it like uh so that you're not uh, so that you could like be covered uh and also click it right there uh because you couldn't see the laptop screen outside of the car or outside of his uh covered thing um but that's basically the only time you'd ever want to use your laptop instead of these little hand controller. That's what the hand controller is there for. It's like walking up to the TV to use, uh, to change the channel. Um,
sorry, I'm just reading through questions. And I hate this dead time. Uh, any comments in the uh, room? Any questions in the room while I uh, <laughs> read a little bit about uh, the difference between servos and uh, steppers and uh, all that stuff? Uh, interesting. Uh, we have uh, someone who uh, knew specific, more specifics about the Celestron uh, hand control said kind of the same thing. Um, We, uh, we, um, oh, that's interesting. I, uh, something I'm not familiar with PWI is this Celestron software? Because it, uh, that's a software that Plane Wave wrote for Celestron's new CGX mounts. Okay, I'm actually not familiar with that, and I'm gonna have mm -hmm. to look into that because I just saw it's like T Point, so that sounds very interesting to me. Yeah, um, PWI is the software we use on the on the L mount. Hmm. And is it a pointing model? What uh, what specifically is it? Uh, you develop a pointing model, and and it uh, then ACP communicates with it, and it communicates with the mount for the go tos. Okay. And it's actually, it's pretty pretty accurate if you have enough points. Um, it, it's not as feature rich as some of the other pieces of software that I've used, but it seems to do its job pretty well. Uh, they just came out with PWI four, which is uh, what we run now. Hmm. Interesting. J just to clarify. Eric's not talking about the Celestron version of the mount. He's talking about what he's using right. with the L mount. The L mount, yes. Um, uh, Renan, uh, very confused by the term side of the pier. Uh, which you understand is used by uh, SGP for peer flip. Uh, I have Tron 45 Pro is not flipping, and some people tell you it is because the mount defines side of peer differently. Um, so basically, this uh, I'm not sure specifically what setting on the I have Tron you would need, but uh, you know, when the uh, mm -hmm. how do you explain it? Uh, when the mount head is in the west, it's pointed to the east, and uh, the opposite is also true. Uh, when it's pointed to the uh, when the mount head is in the east, it's pointed to the west. So, like, uh, they may instead of uh, defining it as where it's pointing, excuse me, as where the mount head is, uh, side of side of pier, they may define it as where it's pointing. So that's how they could define side of pier differently. That doesn't answer your question as to which side of the pier, or how you fix that. Uh, my assumption would be it's just a matter of um, some sort of checkbox. Uh, but um, that's basically uh, the answer. Well, uh, the, the confusion, I think, is where the telescope is and what it's looking at. And the question is always involved in where the telescope head is, not what it's looking at. So west side of the pier means that the telescope is on the west side of the pier, but I'll be looking at a target on the east of the sky, east of the meridian. So when software talks about what side of the pier, they're talking about where the telescope is, not where it's looking. Right. And I'm guessing that if someone's told them that, I'm guessing that Ioptron defines it differently. I don't know if anybody knows the, the answer to that, or maybe not. How long does it take to not be nervous as hell? Excuse me. Uh, how, to not be nervous when you're, that you're not gonna break an expensive mount by doing something stupid. Um, I think the first step is breaking something expensive by doing something stupid. And then uh, you say, oh, you know what? Okay, I did it. First time for everything, and then go on. Uh, 
but I can't say I've actually broken anything uh, really expensive. Um, I melted uh, a solar, uh, what was it called? Uh, I melted an eyepiece in the solar uh, uh, sun cannon or whatever they call that. Um, I did have a pier crash and scraped up my camera and off-axis guider pretty nicely. Uh, never any major damage, though. Um, I ripped a USB cord off a camera. Uh, not USB cord, the USB port of the camera. So the camera had to go back. Uh, and that's when I came up with that computer, the OTA mounted computer design, because all my cables were dangling up by the foot of the tripod. I'm walking around. I stepped on the cable and ripped the um, USB port right off the camera. And I said, that's it. There's got to be, a, I'm not doing this again. Yeah. So I, I don't think that, that, I don't think that ever ends. Mm -hmm. I almost don't count cables because, uh, or, or like tripping over cables and ripping out ports and whatnot. I'm pretty good at replacing ports at this point in my life because I've done it a million times. Um, but, uh, yeah, and Adam's making a good point here. Uh, uh, most mount motors will fault or fuses will blow. Uh, the worst possible thing, I think, in our hobby is broken glass because it's uh, the most expensive part and, and frequently irreplaceable. Uh, like the corrector plates on an SCT or, or something like that. Um, but if you've got an expensive uh, refractor and you break the glass, basically the whole, all, oh, that's basically all the value in the refractor. Yeah, um, you know, the fear of breaking something or having your mount go crazy, I don't think ever really ends, even though you get more accomplished, uh, especially if you're doing it remotely. Uh, there's nothing like turning on TeamViewer and seeing your uh, telescope resting against your flat panel for reasons that you do not understand or things like that. Uh, you'd like to think it's all automated and if you hit the right keys, things will go well. And they usually do, but not 100%. So there's always just a little bit of angst when, <laughs> when you start up. Uh, and for me, remotely, when I log in in the morning and see and hopefully never see something again, like the telescope pointing or resting against the flat panel. Yeah. And we've all had those types of uh, things. I, I had a peer crash incident and I'm, I'm staring at uh, uh, security cam footage of a mount. Uh, but... Uh, you know, just because you have a camera on there doesn't mean nothing's happening to it. It doesn't mean nothing's going wrong. It just means that you can see what's going wrong. And uh, I can remember a few times, those moments of dread where uh, <clears throat> I probably woke up at like 4 o'clock and just checked the camera and uh, saw my mount in that position where it's not supposed to be. And uh, you're like, why didn't it flip? Oh, it's... It, it doesn't look like it flipped, but it's under the pier somehow. And then, yeah, you go out and figure out exactly what's wrong. You make sure everything's all right, which is the worst thing. Uh, from 4 a.m. till 6 a.m., you're making sure everything's fine. Uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I've kind of lost that dread. So... Uh, Yeah, things, uh, things go horrible a lot. Uh, part of the reason why is because we deal, we're dealing with a camera from this manufacturer, a tripod from that manufacturer, and a mount from that manufacturer, a telescope from another manufacturer, and we're, tr we're, the, we're the integrators. We're trying to integrate all these things together with software, with you know cabling and everything, and, but because it was not designed as a package, there's, there's always a chance of forgetting something. Of They call the user error, but then when you're dealing with this many variables, user errors, you're going to make the user error, right? So, uh, I, like Eric's right, I don't think that uh, uh, the coaches, the, I mean, it 
goes up. You know, my, my confidence level with one of my mounts is like 99%, but it's still in, my, in the back of my mind. There's still, I can't not look at the camera. I, it was like the, the Mars rover kind of thing where I could just not see it. And, but there's, there's always that question about always going to the security camera and looking at it because there's always that question. It's like, is it okay? That's, you know. So I don't know if you ever reach that level of saying, you know what, it's okay. No, the, the answer is that you never do. Uh, I had another situation where I couldn't log into the computer and there was a fear that the power had gone out. And until you get back on, until you're connected again, who knows what's going on? If the mount loses power, is it sagging because it's not perfectly balanced? Uh, it could be a couple of tense hours until you get connected and logged back in and everything's okay. The dread of what may be is always worse than what actually is. Um, Especially if you have a very long drive. To yeah, yeah. Situation. But you can only anticipate like the worst of the problems. Uh, you, you never drive three hours away saying, I'm sure it's just that plug. You drive three hours away saying, I'll bet lightning hit it. The place is on fire, and uh, it's 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 always as bad as it could possibly be in your mind, right up until you see it. It was just that simple little plug. Um, David, how how if you're remote, how do you keep Team Viewer from disconnecting? So I'm not quite uh, understanding that. If you're remote away from internet, how do you keep Team Viewer from disconnecting? Um, basically, um, if if you want Team Viewer to be connected remotely over like a cell network, you need internet. Um, you can use Team Viewer locally a few different ways. Um, if that's what you're asking, I, I can almost explain a little bit uh, how, how to do that. Basically, you're just accessing, um, uh, so let me think about this, how would I, how would I do that? Um, I would probably use my phone as a hotspot and uh, access the internet from my laptop to my phone. Um, if not that way, uh, it just kind of depends on exactly what you want to accomplish. That would probably be what I would do is uh, either use my phone as a hotspot or uh, if I could access my um, laptop directly from my phone. Um, my older laptop, I don't believe does that, but the newer ones will. There are other bits of software that you can use besides TeamViewer. Um, you can use a Raspberry Pi running a VNC server, which connects to an external broker. So you don't need a static IP address. Much like TeamViewer, you do lose sound, though. You don't have sound. I think I mentioned that last week, that having sound is quite important. As you listen to your OTA crash into the ground, you might, you might want to hear that. <laughs> More importantly, I use it for listening to gears and fans, but uh, there, there are several other ways to connect in other than TeamViewer because it can time out after a while. Oh, commercial license-wise. Hmm. Dave is saying he's using it at home locally and it's randomly disconnecting. Uh, I don't know what would cause it to randomly disconnect. Um, it honestly could be a million different things. Uh, I almost I, I couldn't even start suggesting. You got reinstall. Uh, if the in if the if you're not having any sort of connection issue issues with the uh um through the router itself or anything like that, then reinstall the client and the server. Um, but uh, I don't know. It could. Be, you almost have to yeah, ask. If you're running the professional yeah. version of Windows, you could also run um, the RPC protocol as well. That's that's included with the professional version of Windows. Sound, everything is transferred across. It's very efficient. And also, it could be it could be installed into the home home uh, version. Oh, can it? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it doesn't come with it like the professional version, but uh, there's a way to install the. Uh, uh, remote uh, windows remote desktop onto the home version 
just do do a search. Uh, how do you install Windows Remote to Desktop onto Windows 10 Home? And uh, that's how I found out about it. That's, that's how I installed it. Windows Remote Desktop, yes. Uh -huh. I mean, and, and plus, there are many. I mean, TeamViewers is not the only way. There are many software. There's, there's LogMeIn. There's ConnectMe. There's AnyDesk. Uh, there is, uh, I just started recently using uh, Chrome Remote Desktop, which works really good. It's free. Uh, you, you just have to have Chrome in your, and it's, it installs as an extension into Google Chrome. It works really nice. Uh, so TeamViewer is not the only option. Yeah, in fact, if you are, uh, if you'd prefer to uh, log in from, say, an iPad or a tablet, uh, you might find uh, other versions. Uh, uh, how do I say this? Um, uh, the way you actually type and you, the... Uh, intuitiveness of the actual um, console could be very important to you. Uh, some of them are more clunky than others. Um, some of them, you know, you're, you're controlling a lot of windows from a tablet. Uh, you really want something that's intuitive. Uh, and some are more intuitive than others. Uh, so it's probably worth trying a few of them. Um, <clears throat> Anything else in the room here? Um, I do want to say this. Uh, I don't have a schedule. Uh, excuse me. I don't have a session for next week. Rather than doing another open session, I am going to cancel next week. I will post that uh, in the. Uh, well, what I will do is uh, sometime midweek, uh, I'll post that the session's canceled, and I'm going to post a session from our archive um, that you can check out. And uh, if you just want to see something, I'll make sure it's a good one. Um, um, I would like to, if anybody in the audience has a presentation about uh, APP, uh, astrophotography, uh, pro I forget the name. Astropixel processor, right? Astropixel. If anybody know how to use it, I would love to see a presentation about that. If, um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna seek someone out because uh, there's been a number of people that have been asking about that. Um, if anybody knows a developer or anything like that, please have them reach out to me, and I'll, I'll try and reach out to them at the same time. Uh, that said, I don't see any other questions coming in, so I am gonna uh, end this session now. But I do want to say thank you. Uh, we will see you in two weeks. Um, keep posting your images, uh, and hopefully uh, you get some clear skies. Uh, again, good night, and uh, see you, like I said, two weeks from now.